Okay, so welcome everyone, and I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of Manchester School of Art to um, welcome you all here. As it says, I am um, the programme leader for the Textiles in Practice degree here at the School of Art. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate undertaking a practice-based PhD. So I'm going to talk to you briefly today about my ongoing research, which is titled Interlute, and that's looking at 3D printed textiles. Um, just a little bit of background, so obviously uh, Ming Jing did a really good job of kind of setting the scene, but a lot of the previous examples of 3D printed textiles explore a chainmail interlocking um, type of logic. So these can be described as discontinuous and multiple assemblies. Um, so this is a kind of key example from 2000, um, really one of the first examples of this um, interlocking chainmail structure being used to create movement and drape. And again, more recent examples, 2014, um, is Tom Mallinson. We do have his samples out in the Special Collections exhibition, so I do encourage you to go and handle these. And again, these are really interesting, but they're built on a chainmail logic in that individual components are linked together to create movement and drapeability. So I came at the premise that these discontinuous multiple assemblies, as it said, are made of multiple parts, and they're flexible due to movement within joints, hinges, and chainmail. So they kind of articulate rather than stretch. So I was interested in the potential to create 3D printed fabrics that had more stretch-based movement um, aligned to more traditional-based textiles. So I kind of summarized these multiple assemblies as types of conventional mechanisms. So this then brings me on to my own area of research. So anyone who's familiar with knitting will know that knitting is made from a continuous geometry, a continuous thread to create interlooping loops, and that allows the fabrics that are produced to have stretch, inherent stretch of movement within them. So I was really interested in seeing how these textile logics of knitting could be translated into 3D print, and if that was possible. So this was sort of 2014, so quite a while ago. I was fortunate enough to meet with Jonathan at a 3D print show in London, um, and quite quickly um, started talking to his bureau, Digits to Widgets. And they were great in the fact that they were really supportive of having a go. I sent these really basic initial CAD files to them and they said, well, we can't promise they'll work, but we'll try them anyway. Um, and they did work and they worked in quite a small scale, which was really interesting. And not only did they print, but they maintained NIT's inherent properties of stretch, movement and elasticity. So these were really exciting at this point. So I started to think about these continuous geometries and how they deform, um, transform move, movement through flexible members rather than movable joints. And like I say, these demonstrated these stretch-like qualities, which I thought were really important. So I came at these as the premise that they were a form of dynamic compliant mechanisms. So the simplest form of a compliant mechanism being a paper clip. So a continuous structure that has movement and flexibility within a um, single structure can be applied to the idea of knitting as well. So um, it was really nice to see Ming Jin had included these in the scoping of the um, history of 3D printing. So this then led on to a collaborative project with a former colleague, um, Laura McPherson. So this was exploring how 3D printed elements could be combined with actual uh, machine knitted fabrics. So again, these pieces are available in the special collections. Um, you can have a look at them. So yeah, this was really exploring how 3D printed elements could be integrated into machine knitted lycra. <laughs> dramatic, dramatic. This might be the sound check that they said was at lunch because I think we're running slightly over. So, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah? I'll, I'll try and talk. Hopefully it's short-lived. Um, yeah, so like I say, the things we were looking at was the idea of integration. So you need to bear in mind this was 2014, so there are ways now that you can print directly onto fabrics. These were very early days, so this was me 3D printing these components, handing them over to my colleague Laura, who was then manually embedding and knitting them into the base fabric of the Lycra. So like Min Jing was saying, it was very much about the digital, then being combined with the hand process, so quite labour intensive. Um, but just interested in how the two reacted with each other, and the kind of performance and stretch, and how it affected the base fabric. We also explored them as forms of embellishment. So again, looking at dip dye and dye in the plastic, because at the time, a lot of it was very neutral and white. So we, were, we kind of mimicked a knitted loop, and they were then embellished back onto the fabric. And again, this transformed the fabric into, in terms of its movement and drapeability and weight. So these were interesting starting points. 
And then another example, kind of following that emulation of a knitted loop through the 3D printer that was then manually knitted back through and fed through. So that kind of ended the collaboration with myself and my colleague, but I was quite keen to see how much further the idea of these knitted structures could be pushed, but purely 3D printed rather than combined with traditional fabrics. So this is the PhD title, um, Investigation into How the Primary Structures of Knit Can Inform and Enhance Material 3D Printed Structures. The aims are to develop a body of practice, which is... Um, on display out in the foyer for later, um, looking at how knits interlooping structure and inherent stretch can be embedded. And also key is a second part to explore potential application areas for the textile structures as a source of innovation and novelty. So you'll see hopefully, as I show you some of the samples, they move beyond just replicating what's possible to knit or machine knit to do things that really maximize the digital platform of the CAD modeling and the software and the materials available to create structures that behave in original ways. So quite quickly, I moved from flat sheets into more tubular structures. So tubular knitting is obviously a very common thing. Um, these are interested in that they're continuous this way, but not in the length way. So they kind of have a slinky spring-like movement whilst also incorpor incorporating the knitted um, stretch. So again, they behave in a familiar way, but also have an unfamiliar sort of movement. So this was some of the initial testing and experimentation. I have these samples out for later. So again, this was challenging how small they could become, how fine the yarn could be. The top one kind of emulates the idea of a twist of yarn, so you'll see that it kind of looks like a ply. This one on this um, right-hand side uses the digital platform to create an embedded curve, so that will never fully stretch out. It always returns back to its um, shaped state. Again, one key thing I was looking at was how small things could go. So these are sort of three, four years old now. So at the time, this was really pushing EOS's technology on their SLS printers, whilst working with Jonathan's Bureau, who, who kept kind of being very willing and open to collaborating, trying to go smaller and smaller. Um, I worked with one of their CAD designers, Tom Mallinson, who's been a massive support all the way through. Again, he really understands the software and the machine, so he could really push the limitations of those machines. And then again, yeah, kind of sweeping along a curve, it gives it kind of like an interesting hinged articulation um, and movement, which is quite unusual. And then again, playing more, you know, just with sliders and things in Grasshopper, just to manipulate and distort to see how you could contract it in places whilst having it more open and flexible in others. I have a couple of little clips, which I know everyone is slightly late, but I'll show you a few. We're good? So yeah, these are um, yeah, some tests of how they move. So hopefully you'll engage with them this afternoon. Um, you can see they are very flexible. Um, they move, they stretch, they bend, they bounce back. Um, they feel quite fragile. Sometimes people hold them and are worried they're going to break, but actually they are durable. Jonathan will vouch for that. They've been to many exhibitions and shows have been handled quite a lot. So yeah, so I was really excited that you could get this movement, this flexibility, this stretch um, coming off the machine. And then again, key was to see how small and how fine these could go. So this was really pushing the boundaries of the printer at the time. And Jonathan was actually the hand model for a lot of these um, digits to widgets. So <laughs> we've had a long relationship through 3D printing. <laughs> um, and then just to show you some of the more complex CAD work. So this is when I really did have to work with Tom a lot because obviously these were very complex. Um, actually looking at twisting and plying. Um, but yeah, just a really nice example of how you can see what the CAD work looks like. And it's kind of fidelity and closeness to the actual final print. So there's a real kind of nice relationship between the CAD and what then is printed. But like Ming Jun was saying, it was really important for me to have these physically printed and fabricated to see how they behave and perform. Um, 
had ideas of what they might do, but it was quite surprising when some of them printed what they did and didn't do, and some interesting things happened along that process. So again, this is probably one that references more um, of a sort of potential fashion outcome. I've never really pinned down at the moment um, one application. It's kind of explorative and speculative, but obviously this lends itself to the idea of a sleeve, a garment, and again, it's referenced to traditional textile qualities, it makes it kind of more acceptable, I suppose. So, yeah, this is one of the larger pieces. Okay, so just to summarise at the moment, so the research kind of sits at this intersection. It's a combination of both, well, of three things. It's the material that I'm working with, which um, is nylon 12, so it's got its own mechanical properties, which is flexibility and material memory. It's that in combination with the knitted structure, which inherently has stretch and extensibility. And it's also the process of the digital modelling, which allows for forms that are weightless, seamless, and gravityless um, on the screen to be physically modelled and refabricated. Um, to create these fine structures with no support. And it's really what happens when they come off the machine and how they behave that interests me and where they might go in terms of application. So moving forward, it is to continue this idea of 3D printed textiles are still very much a material proposal. They're not resolved as such. Um, so we're starting to see some commercial applications, but they're still very much speculative. So it's looking at these new behaviours um, and seeing how they might be applied as a proof of concept through collaboration um, or industrial um, consultation. So that's the kind of PhD side. Then COVID struck and the university paused staff PhDs. So there was a pause for two years. And then lo and behold, the software moved on, the equipment moved on, and I almost uh, predated my own PhD. Um, so the current work I'm working on now is working with EOS's um, cutting edge technology, which is FDR, so fine detail resolution. Um, I was really lucky that Jonathan put me in touch with Bjora in Austria, who uh, have got an exclusive license on this uh, machine at the moment. So I'm working with those guys in Austria to take my existing files and really see how small they can be scaled down. Um, and you'll see some of the results now are, are pretty um, impressive in terms of how much smaller they can now go. So yeah, as it says here, this uses a, a very fine beam, um, twice as small as existing SLS. Um, so you can have extremely fine surfaces. Um, but still stable parts, minimum wall thickness of 0.22, and a massive advantage of this is it now uses PA11, which is 100% bio-based um, polymer made from castor oil, so it kind of addresses some of the nylon 12 I was working with previously. So I think I have a little clip. Changed hand models as the work's got finer, we've got a nicer hand model. Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, so you can see, a lot smaller, um, and then you start to think about potential other new applications, whether they could be sort of more medical-based or body-related, um, as well as more decorative. Again, I have those pieces on display, so feel free to have a look um, afterwards.